Professor Georgina May is head of the Center for Bio uh, Biodiversity and I event, I event, I Environment Research at the University College London. Her research concerns the assessment of extinction risk among contemporary species and measuring the trends and consequences of biodiversity loss and change. She led the process to develop test, to develop test and document criteria for listing species on International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List of Threatened Species and has been a major contributor to national and international biodiversity assessments. She is a member of the government's Natural Capital Committee. Georgina Mays will give a talk which asks the question, are we given the current extinction rates indeed in the midst of the mass extinction? And will climate change make it even more difficult to plan conservation strategies? Please join me in welcoming Georgina Mays. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a, it's a remarkable feature of our planet that it has life on it. And that life on our planet is the distinguishing feature of the Earth. And there are maybe five or ten million species now living on the Earth. And it's a remarkable feature of one of those species, which is us, um, that we actually had the technology and the engineering skills to be able to go into space and look at our own planet from the outside. So we're the only one of those 10 million or so species that has anything like um, the capacity to do that, to go and look at the Earth from space. And of course, that ability that people have had, that level of technology, of engineering, of skill, the cultural um, elements of societies that allowed us to do that, have allowed us to dominate the Earth in very many ways. And I want to just uh, present to you some of the evidence we have about whether, as we've developed that incredible amount of technology and innovation, we've also taken the Earth uh, into a sixth mass extinction. So one of the reasons to think we might do that is we dominate the Earth in a huge way. Um, if we take this measure of dominating the Earth as how much of all the energy that's produced by plants using the energy from the sun, how much of that total uh, primary production on the Earth is used by people, the answer is getting on for about a half of it. So one of the 10 million species is using about half of all the energy on the Earth. And the areas in this map here that are orange or brown, it's well over half. So people are dominating by taking most of the planet's energy, uh, either directly or indirectly. And that has been the end of a process, the end of a process of human growth, of growth in um, numbers of people, but also in the way that people live their lives. Not only how many people there are, but all the stuff that we do every day. And uh, uh, this growth has recently started to be called the Great Acceleration. And the Great Acceleration is the rapid rise in the number of people and in all this stuff they do um, since about the time of the Industrial Revolution. And, and then increasingly since about 1950. So you can't read all these little graphs here. It doesn't, really doesn't matter. All of them show the increase in something to do with people since 1750. And the one on the top left there is population. And all the others are something else. There's something we do. Um, how much water we use, how much fertilizer we consume, um, how much CO2 there is in the atmosphere, how much paper we've made. And as you can see, most of those are actually increasing faster than population is. So there's more people, but they're doing more things. Actually, the one that's increasing fastest, which is um, in the third row down and the third from the left, is the growth in McDonald's restaurants. That is the winner in the Great Acceleration. So all this growth in activity of what people are doing begs the question, so what's happening to all these other millions of species on the Earth? How are they coping with the fact that we are uh, one species that's dominating so massively. And there have been various attempts made to try and measure the current rate of extinction compared to uh, rates of extinction in the past. 
And this is a rather horribly complicated way of looking at it, but it's actually very simple. The, the axis on the left, the y-axis, is just a measure of the extinction rate, and there are just three time periods along the bottom. The fossil record, a bit on the left, the 20th century, the present day, and then the bit to the right is various models of the future, which I'm not really going to talk about. But if you just look at the extinction rate in the left, the one on the fossil record, and compare it to the one for the 20th century, and if you notice that the y-axis is actually a logarithmic scale, so it goes up from less than 1 to close to 100, that's roughly how much uh, the extinction rate of species has been increased over background rates in the fossil record by this um, increasing impact of large numbers of people doing large amounts of stuff on the Earth. Of course, it's very uncertain. The fact is we don't know in a, within an order of magnitude or two. And when you go into the future, you see those bars becoming very tall, and that's because that uncertainty is getting even higher. But we have increased the extinction rate by 100, maybe 1,000 times, somewhere around that. Now, in the past, when there's been that level of extinction increase, it's been called a mass extinction. These major periods of loss of species in the past, when perhaps 75 or more than 90% of all the species were lost, were the great mass extinctions of the fossil record. And there have been books produced saying, we are in the midst of a sixth mass extinction, we're not on a sixth mass extinction. And there was a very nice study that came out um, a couple of years ago that actually looks at this question very carefully and analytically. Are we entering a sixth mass extinction? Now, again, answering this question is really complicated because we don't measure extinctions today the way that we measure them in the fossil past. We, in the past, we measured a small number of species that happened to have good fossilized remains over very long periods of time, but we missed many things. Now we have a little snapshot, a couple of decades at best, but we know lots about many species. And so what this plot shows you is what the extinction rate is now taking into account that we're sampling very differently now than in the past. So any blob that's in the yellow bit is within background rates. There's nothing exceptional about it. And any blob that's outside the yellow bit um, is going to qualify as being unusual. And if it's above the yellow blob, it's going to be qualifying as a mass extinction. So you see these red blobs. These are the Pleistocene extinctions. They sit firmly within background rates. Extinction rates have always varied. The orange circles are contemporary extinctions. You can see they're getting to the top of this yellow blob. We're getting close to the edge. But the contemporary extinctions are still within the yellow blob. We are not yet in a sixth mass extinction. Now, those brown triangles that are outside the yellow blob, those are species extinction rates if the species currently listed on the IUCN red list turn out to go extinct. So if our current set of threatened species go extinct, that takes us into the mass extinction. And so the answer to this question is, we're not yet in it, but if we allow those species to go extinct, then we will be. So we are right on the edge at the moment. It's within our power to keep extinction rates within the yellow blob, within background rates. So what does all that mean? It means that this one... Every time we lose one of those species, sorry, we're losing some bit of the network of life on Earth. We're losing some bit of the fabric of life on Earth. And there are two really important kinds of networks. One of them is the tree of life, the one on the left, the evolution of all these species, the, the living descendants that we have today carry with them this footprint of the past, of all those ancestors that came before them. And then the web on the right, the interaction web, this is another kind of web on which we depend. The whole integrity of life on Earth comes from that web of interactions between contemporary species. Now, we are just one little bit of this tree of life. Um, the whole tree of life is actually huge. The mammals, of which you are one, is one little node on that tree. And if you look at this tree on the right, 
a thing that really looks like a tree, is a phylogenetic tree of the mammals. And the thickness of the branch is the amount of genetic information. And you see all these branches growing up over time with all the contemporary species on them. And you see the little blob that says, you are here. If you trace that back down through the scales, you'll see what an infinitely small little branch uh, people are on that great big tree of life. And yet that one species on there is having a huge impact on all the other species in this whole radiation on the left. I want to try and show you something about the scale of this tree of life using a little animation of the evolution of the tetrapods. So this is everything from the amphibians, the reptiles, the mammals, um, the birds, evolving over hundreds of millions of years. And this is a, a tree that shows you from the size of the branches all the diversity that's growing, uh, represented in forms that we have today. And every one of the tips at the end there is a species. Um, and the species are colored according to whether they're endangered or not. So the red ones actually have a, I'll run this backwards just so you can see it again. So this is 200 millions of years of evolution now uh, running backwards. So all the red blobs are where the species are all endangered in some way. So if you lose those red blobs, you will um, lose all of that bit of the tree of life. I mean, this shows you very clearly um, how many of these much diversification has happened even in the last uh, couple of hundred million years. So let's go in and have a look in here at the mammals. So there's the monotremes. We can go and have a look at the mammal radiation. Here are the rodents, there's lots of those. Here we go into the primates. Here we're going into some, there's the lemurs of Madagascar. This is the tree, the bit of the tree that has apes and humans on it. So here's the gorillas and the chimpanzees. And there's one green blob in this tree. The rest of them are all red or brown. Um, and I won't give prizes to tell you that that green blob is people. So that's just to give you a sense of this um, massive tree of life that we are all part of. And as we um, lose species, we're losing those little branches from the tree. I'm oh, sorry. So why does that matter? Because we depend on the fabric of that life, both the tree and the interaction web in many ways. We depend on it for food, fiber, fuel. We depend on it to regulate the planet that we live on, for the climate, for regulation against natural hazards, for disease resistance, for pest and pathogen resistance. We depend on it for fundamental ecological processes, the soil, the regulation of water, and we depend on it for our sense of place and identity, aesthetic enjoyment, spiritual values. And of course, we depend on it um, for these evolutionary benefits, the whole innovation that the tree of life gives us. So this huge effect that we're having on the world um, is picking away at that tree of life and the interaction web on which we depend. So I just want to finish by saying extinction matters, and we're at a bit of a turning point. Thank you.